Today we're talking about the mechanisation of British agriculture during the Second World War, but I'd like to start the story back in the Roman times with part of a poem by a man called Virgil. Unless you continually attack weeds with your hoe, and scare the birds with noise, and cut back the shade from the dark soil with your knife, and call up rain with prayers, alas, you'll view others' vast hayricks in vain, and stave off hunger in the woods, shaking the oak branches. There is a lot of talk these days about a desire to farm with nature, which I think is strange. The forces of nature are unstoppable. You can't defeat them. But the forces of nature don't want us to grow crops, and we need to do that to survive. The fundamental task of agriculture is, while trapped within nature, to wrestle against it. Not to defeat it, you can't defeat it, but to channel its forces in such a way that it will yield enough for you to survive. This battle has characterised the entirety of human history. All we have at our disposal is our ingenuity and the tools that that might produce. The plough was invented a very long time ago to break up the earth, and we built structures to shield ourselves from the elements. And this was all done with the exertion of man. As Virgil said, if we stop fighting the forces of nature, we will be reduced to shaking oak trees in hope that an acorn might fall for us to eat. And at no time was this more apparent than in the Second World War. You know the basics. We live on an island, and we were at war with Germany. And they had submarines, and we imported a lot of our food. There had been a savage agricultural depression before the war, but farmers turned it round so the country wouldn't starve. Big success. The influential agricultural scientists of this age shared Virgil's assessment of agriculture. Winning the war would mean fighting the forces of nature at home to prevent starvation as much as it would mean fighting the enemy overseas. The farmer is in direct conflict all the time with the forces of nature, and if he should suspend his efforts, though even only for a short time, he is beaten. But we had a new toy to help with this battle the tractor. In the context of war, mechanisation was absolutely necessary because the agricultural depression had been so savage that we no longer had the horses required to do the ploughing. But these machines really captured the imagination of the government and were seen as symbols of a new progressive Britain. And there were indeed lots of very cool machines. There was a great deal of excitement around gyro tillers, which were big tracked machines that cultivated the ground with two rotating sets of blades trailed behind it. These could churn up unused land ready for a crop to be sown, making it productive. Here's one cultivating wasteland. Despite all the hype, gyro tillers seem not to have survived very long after the war, and I have never seen a modern equivalent machine, so they were probably not that good after all. The most common tractor was the Fordson N, which wasn't vastly different from the machines used in the First World War. They were painted orange and weren't very ergonomic. My great-grandfather was an agricultural contractor during the war, and they used to run machines for 24 hours a day in 12-hour shifts. And this crippled him, so by the end of the war, to get him off the tractor, they had to unpin the seat and roll him off the back. There were various modifications made to these tractors, like the addition of tracks and the addition of this other type of track that, like the gyro tiller, seems to have been left behind as technology has moved on. I am a little bit nervous discussing the technical details of tractors because I feel my comment section will be better informed than I am, but it's safe to say this was a golden age of the contraption. The government brought a lot of Fords and Ends to help with the plough-up campaign, and also brought lots of ditching equipment to sort out the drainage, so the government was very involved with the rollout of these new machines, and they made good use of them. I have no idea where this footage was taken, but I would bet you it's not ploughed today. Between the wars, Harry Ferguson had invented the three-point linkage, which gave tractors lift arms and allowed them to pick stuff up off the ground, which was something horses couldn't do. The technology did exist and was fitted to some Ford tractors, but became widespread only after the war with the iconic little grey Ferguson tractors. These could lift ploughs off the ground and be fitted with primitive front loaders and even partake in expeditions to cold places. The coming of the machine was seen to herald a new age of agriculture. With a tractor, you could cover more ground faster, and the machine didn't need rest. Between the wars, many farmers weren't even ploughing, let alone operating machines. But farmers showed themselves able to adapt very quickly to these new methods of mechanised agriculture, which is something the government took a very keen interest in, because without it, we risked being starved out of the war. The wartime experience demonstrated to Britain's political class that farmers were good citizens, as this wartime film explains. The British farmer today is also a mechanic, an engineer working on the land. 
to his inborn knowledge of soil and climate, of crops and livestock, he has had to add, during the last 30 years, a knowledge of gears and carburetors, of sprockets and sparking plugs. For a brief time, this debunked the enduring cultural perception that farmers are stupid and unenterprising. The rapidity and success with which farmers and farmhands alike have made themselves competent mechanics is a sufficient answer to those who think the countryman is devoid of intelligence and the will to learn. And it was not unheard of for farmers to build their own machines, like this rather intricate trenching equipment. Another working farmer has invented this handy ditcher. Farmers were using their skills and ingenuity to help drain the land and produce food for the common good. Good drainage is a vital factor in British farming. Without it, arable land would not be fully productive, and much of the best pasture land would quickly become useless bark. Last week someone asked if farmers still make their own machines, and I can say that we do. The Farmers Weekly, the trade magazine, holds an inventions competition from time to time, which is the most interesting thing you'll read in it. People build all sorts of stuff, like a winch to stop people stealing your quad bike when they break in to steal it, an adapted lorry that can load itself with bales, or even a self-propelled hedge cutter built of other machines. All part of the fun. But crucially, these machines allowed the decay of the interwar years to be undone. Machines could dig out ditches, straighten streams, rip out trees and collect scrub into piles so it could be burnt and the land could be ploughed up. Where the land had been becoming derelicts before the war, these machines could make up for lost time in the battle against the natural world. The government in this political moment really don't like the concept of nature as a state of being for lots of reasons that we'll talk about in the future. Subscribe. But the most immediate of these was the imminent threat of starvation and this led them to conceptually link nature to death in a lot of their publications. The official history of the wartime countryside, Land at War, written by Laurie Lee, describes the natural world in military terms, with pigeons discussed as insatiable marauders and very cunning, who must be ruthlessly destroyed, while land reverting to nature is a sinister process. And the history compares unimproved land to a graveyard, saying petrified bog oaks stuck in the ground are like oversized coffins in a churchyard, which must be dynamited to be removed. In upcoming episodes, we'll see that the wartime and post-war governments get really enthusiastic about attacking nature. But the concept of using machines to better channel the forces of the natural world was not a new idea in the Second World War. Farmers had been using machines to improve productivity for centuries, from Jethro Tull's seed drill and horse hoe in the 18th century to steam ploughs in the Victorian era. These were considered to be so efficient that they gave British farming a hope to compete on the world stage after the repeal of the protectionist corn laws, which we talked about ages ago. And steam machinery was still in regular use during the Second World War. So mechanisation wasn't really a new concept to people who were interested in the land, but the British government had pretty well been ignoring farming since the repeal of the Corn Laws, so when it suddenly turns its attention to the land and sees all these machines, it gets overexcited about them. After the war, they decide to apply the energy with which they just fought Germany to agriculture. They tried to grow lots of peanuts in a colony in modern-day Tanzania in East Africa using Sherman tanks modified by the Vickers company into tractors called Sherviks. They clear the land to make a giant monoculture farm roughly the size of Yorkshire in an unpopulated and essentially uninhabitable region. This is a very interesting combination of colonialism, military organisation and state socialism in agriculture and because the region was not suited to growing peanuts, the result of this was the government failing to grow any peanuts and losing a lot of money. We'll cover this soon, on balance it's one of the most bizarre things that has ever happened. So this enthusiasm for mechanisation and scientific farming inspires the government to try and defeat nature, which cannot be done, and they learn that the hard way. But I would argue the coming of the tractor did not signify an ideological change in ordinary farmers. Getting a tractor for the first time was a significant event for the family, sure, and they tend to remember it. But tractors were adopted on farms for economical reasons. They didn't get tired or need feeding or get ill like horses did. And in most cases, they literally replaced horses Machines that had been horse-drawn, like reaper binders, were refitted with a hitch and pulled by a tractor. When, after the war, the war broke out and then we, we started having tractors, we adapted most of the 
horse drawn tools to the to fit behind the tractor. We have very little bought specifically for the tractor until later on. So while the government do get really enthusiastic about machines and go a bit crazy with it, I would argue that farmers were a little bit more level-headed. While the concept of nature and an uncontrolled wilderness were seen as very bad things by governments in this time, that doesn't mean these people weren't environmentalists. This period gives us green belts and national parks protecting the countryside from the city. But these things were not natural, they were designed. Grassland scientist George Stapledon, whose thinking was the backbone of the post-war settlement, proposed national parks between the wars and he meticulously planned the vegetation that would exist there. There was an appreciation of beauty and natural things in this ideology, but those things were to be shaped by man to be as efficient as possible in all senses. Food production aside, to maximise the land's potential as an amenity, to ensure that we lived in a country as beautiful as it could be, man would have to control nature. He would have to design the landscape and its plants and its animals and channel them all in the desired direction. We've discussed this before in this video and we'll discuss it even more as we reach the end of the war. But Stapledon and the post-war Labour government believed the culture of England reflected its land surface. So if we wanted enlightened, tolerant, intelligent and hard-working citizens in modern Britain, we must create a landscape and from that a society that produces those people. Stapledon said, The beauty of rural England owes an immense amount to the thousands who maintain its lovely gardens and to the owners of woodlands and parklands. There is an appreciation of beauty there, but it's not a state of nature. It's a cultivated environment, managed and designed for the enlightenment of citizens. The spirit of a country, if it is to be true to itself, needs continually to draw great breaths of inspiration from the simple realities of the country. From the smell of its soil, the pattern of its fields, the beauty of its scenery, and from the men and women who dwell and toil in the rural areas. The first of all necessities is to maintain a large, vigorous, purposeful, and wholly contented rural population. It must be provided with facilities on par with the most up-to-date factory and with amenities for its workers equivalent to the best that any city can provide. Nothing less will do if once again we are to have a robust rural Britain with the sons and daughters of the soil contributing in full measure to the social and political thought and progress of Britain. The desire to control the forces of nature, to do better than what might naturally occur, to make the earth more fertile and the landscape more beautiful, fits entirely within the political context of the time. The post-war Labour government were socialists who wanted to design a better country for the ordinary people. And that meant being proactive and standing in the way of natural things like the free market and social hierarchy and even illness. The state would intervene and care for its citizens from the cradle to the grave. We get a national health service and a cheap food policy. No longer would the government just let things be. And the countryside was part of this. They establish a minimum wage for farm workers and try to provide amenities in rural communities to stop people leaving them for the city as they had been doing before the war. And there lies the great irony of mechanisation. The farmer's adoption of the machine during wartime was so impressive that it earned rural communities special protections after the war. But at the same time, with the machine, the government had unleashed something that would destroy these same communities by reducing the labour force required to do agricultural work. And for some reason, they don't see this coming. The wise use of machine power on the land means more intensive production per acre and does not mean any decrease in the number of workers employed. Time and the back aching fatigue of the old hand planting methods are saved and labour released for other jobs about the farm. I presume this is because during the war there was a lot of maintenance work that needed doing which was largely undertaken by prisoners of war and the county war agricultural executive committees who had lots of drainage equipment. So during these few war years the countryside was both mechanised and using a lot of labour. But after a few years the maintenance was all done and inevitably the rural workforce continued to decline. I think machines have also made the farming community more insular over time, as in times past the village community and the extended family might help with labour at busy times of year, but increasingly farmers work alone with their machines. Our farm used to house two whole families of workers, but now it's just a part-time job for one person, because we have our machines. 
and with that, over the next few weeks, we're going to start looking at the post-war settlement and discuss whether a state of nature is a desirable thing and whether or not the government was right in this period, which has implications for the present day. If you do appreciate what I'm doing here, I've set up a buy me a coffee if you fancy leaving a tip. No pressure at all, but it would help. These aren't free to produce. Next week, we're going to have a look at why a cheap food policy emerged and what a socialist government wants from the land. I'll see you then.